So I think we can start now. Uh, today I will try to show to you an overview of a concert grand piano regulation, uh, voicing and tuning. It's uh, normally we call that uh, a concert grand preparation and optimization, because many pianists um, knows about a little bit about piano tuning. Uh, but uh, preparing a concert grand piano is not only about piano tuning. Uh, there is uh, several operations needed. Um, uh, generally, uh, we need uh, something like three days of working to prepare a concert grand. And today, uh, we try quickly, <laughs> uh, in one hour, to, to explain um, this, all this operation. So, uh, normally, when you prepare a piano, you start by the action regulation. Uh, the action is that part in the piano. And this is very important because uh, it is all about uh, uh, kinetic energy transmission. When the pianist will play, uh, he needs uh, a correct uh, uh, transmission of the energy. Uh, if the pianist do something, he need a result at the end of the chain. But unfortunately, between this and this, the hammer, you have 34 points of regulation where you can lose energy. And that's why it's so important to optimize uh, the transmission of the energy. The second part of the preparation of concert piano is the tuning, so we will speak about tuning, and I will try to explain uh, what is tuning, what we listen when we tune a piano, and what are the techniques. Uh, is it uh, uh, only feeling, or is it uh, mathematics, physics? I will try to give you a better view about uh, tuning and how it works. And the next part uh, will be about piano voicing. The voicing is maybe the most important operation in concert piano. The voicing is the management of the spectral content of the sound, uh, the timbral content of the sound. Uh, the sound are made uh, with overtones, and we manage uh, and sculpt uh, these overtones to do uh, the, the sound of such a piano. So, the first thing is the action regulation. First, first things to do when you, you start to prepare a piano. Uh, I already said why it's so important. Because it's uh, for the transmission of energy, really. Uh, it's really, really important. But not only it has to transmit the energy, uh, but also everything in piano regulation is about regularity. Because uh, each key uh, needs to have the same uh, quality of transmission. Uh, if the C here trans uh, transmits super good the energy and the C sharp no, uh, it will be a problem for the pianist because at high speed they don't have the time to adjust, you know, so the piano has to be very equal. Uh, and there is 88 key on a piano. So we will have a, a look, short look of uh, grand piano regulation operation. This is the list of normal operation uh, needed for a, a grand piano. Some are very simple, like tighten plate screw, uh, because the piano needs the maximum rigidity, and sometimes with transport, uh, the wood could move, and the screw uh, could move as well, so it's very important to tight all the screw, even the screw from the plate, uh, to, to allow the piano to be as strong as possible. To, to, because if you have vibration, vibration means you lose energy. So uh, this is very important. Uh, after that, you have some very, uh, thing, things like action location, ESK. Uh, today, I don't have time to uh, uh, look at operation one after the other. We will just take a few of them and we will have a look on just few operations. But normal, normally, when you prepare a piano for a concert, uh, for example, what we call in Vienna, we call that a piano servicing, uh, this 
uh, take one day of work. It's one, the first day of work is this list uh, of operation. Uh, so some few examples. Uh, the first thing is, uh, example is the hammer traveling. You know, uh, inside the piano, you have the hammer and the hammer are going straight to the strings. But uh, the problem is about straight because the hammer are made uh, uh, with wood and screw on the action and the wood could move. So uh, with effect of the uh, hygrometry change and uh, temperature change, uh, the hammer could uh, go like that, what we call traveling. And if the hammer travel, it don't go straight to the string, so you lose energy. And as well, uh, you can get some problem of the contact of the hammer to the string. So the first things to do is to ensure uh, the hammer travel uh, travel well. I will just show to you quickly how we check that. Oops. So we look at the hammer like that, and we let the hammer go up, and we look, and if we find the hammer goes left on or right, we will use a very small part of paper, this, this very small part of paper, we will cut a small part of this paper, and we will glue it, I will not do it now because well, the time is short, and we will glue it under uh, the hammer, so it will correct the trajectory of the hammer. So we check all the hammer like that. That's the hammer traveling. Also, this is not. If you cannot regulate the piano, maybe you can use this to destroy everything. It could be useful, <laughs> but normally, this is useful not for the traveling, but for the angle of the hammer head, because the hammer could go straight. But possibly the hammer head could be left or right. So in that case, we use that tool, like that. We hit just a little bit the wood, and it allows us to modify uh, uh, slowly the angle of the hammer. So this is the hammer position. Um, because we move the hammer to put them onto the, uh, the strings. After that, uh, I always speak about energy transmission. We need a straight line. So we have to do a line between the weapon, that part, and the hammer. So once the hammer are on the strings, we do, uh, we align all this part to the hammer to get a perfect transmission of the energy. Naturally, if things are not aligned, you lose energy. <laughs> when I teach uh, that job to my student, I think the most things I say is you lose energy. <laughs> That's the most important uh, things. So uh, after that, uh, another example, the jack alignment and the height of the jack. The jack, what is it here? Is this small piece it's difficult to see here because it's black on black. It is this small piece and that piece will push up the hammer. Uh, and this has to be absolutely in line with uh, this small wood part in the knuckle. So the small white um, line here uh, allow the technician to... Uh, this example is not very good because the regulation is not very good on that example. The uh, jack is a little bit too much on the right because normally this has to be in line with that part. Always the same thing to have a good transmission of energy. So we regulate this, but naturally uh, jack by jack, key by key, 88 times, always 88 times naturally. And uh, we adjust also the jack eight because the jack uh, on the weapon uh, is positioning here and with the finger we touch it and we feel the distance of the jack 
from the top of the weapon. And we said uh, the distance has to be equal to uh, a, a cigarette paper. You know the size of cigarette paper. So uh, we, you fill that with a finger and you check all weapon and you regulate uh, this distance by touch. And if you don't smoke, um, it would uh, be more difficult. <laughs> So it's a few examples of regulation. Naturally, there is 24. But another one, very important, uh, the key leveling, uh, the keyboard has to be straight, naturally, a perfect line, because we will, mm -hmm. yeah, we will uh, regulate uh, the, the keyboard straight, and after that, we will manage what we call the key dip. Uh, and for the pianist, the key dip has to be absolutely equal from key to key. Uh, so if you start with a keyboard like a Russian mountain, uh, uh, it will be very difficult to get the same uh, sensation for the pianist. So the first thing to do is to do a perfectly straight keyboard. So we use a, a ruler and some very small part of paper Uh, here, you can see we glisse some very small part of paper under the keyboard. Uh, this is, a, I don't know the size, but 0 0.01 or 0 0.2 uh, millimeter. And we adjust the level of each key separately uh, here to get a straight line. Uh, this is the black key uh, checking. We check the height of each black key. And the hammer blow distance, the hammer blow distance is the distance between the hammer to the strings. Uh, today I cannot develop, but this is very important because you have a ratio between the hammer distance and the key dip, naturally. That's a ratio, and it's up to the technician to take the decision how we manage this uh, relation between the key dip and the hammer distance. But the hammer distance is generally at 46 millimeters. Okay, this is not so important. The let off, the let off, uh, is when you play the piano. If you play slowly, uh, when you arrive at two millimeter or 1.5 millimeter, depending on the regulation of the strings, the hammer will stop, uh, his travel and, uh, it will just continue with the speed accumulated. But, uh, because if the hammer go to the strings, if we don't have let off, it will stop the sound naturally because it's a mass of felt and if it touch, uh, if it stay on the strings, naturally the strings cannot vibrate. So the hammer go to the strings, um, knock it uh, very fast and remove to let the strings uh, vibrate. So this is the let off regulation. It has to be at two millimeter everywhere uh, in the piano. And the key dip, naturally, very important. Uh, we measure with uh, this kind of tool. It's a bit far. Uh, it's a small tool. It, it, uh, the size is 10.1 millimeter. And we use that tool to check from key to key the key dip of the keyboard to have always uh, the same key dip everywhere. And we use some very small punch paper, like for the keyboard level. Uh, we use some very small uh, part of paper to put under the keyboard to get the line absolutely perfect. So finally, the balance raised stud. This is a very important regulation. The key frame is in contact with what we call the key bed. And uh, this contact has to be absolutely perfect uh, because uh, if uh, the pianist plays staccato. If the action do uh, movement like that, it will absorb the energy and the energy will not go to the hammer. So the pianist will lose some power and, uh, uh, and some transmission. So the, it is very important to uh, do this regulation. And I will show to you how we practice that. That's the last regulation. <laughs> Thank you. 
to do this regulation, we, we do by sound, we listen the, the, the sound of the wood and we can determine it, who, is, who is the quality of the contact of each part. Uh, it needs a lot of years of practice. <laughs> and we listen that, but naturally there is some trick to determine exactly what we are doing, but basically it's by sound. Uh, also on the front, uh, the stainway are typical. They have always uh, no contact in that part, so you can hear the effect. Here I have a contact, and here I don't have con don't don't have contact. Listen, you see, this is a loss of energy. But on the stainway, it's normal. It's typical from stainway because the action is a curve like that uh, because the block here will press on this part and will. Um, press the action to the, to the key bed. So it's typical from Stenway. But it's a good example to let you listen what, what we listen about the wood. Contact. Good contact, no contact. So, that's all for the regulation. Uh, very fast, naturally. One day of working in uh, 15 minutes. <laughs> now the piano tuning. Uh, the first thing uh, to know about piano tuning is the structure of a piano. Maybe you don't know, or pianist knows, but maybe not the other people. Uh, for each key in the piano, you have three strings. Uh, in the treble, medium, uh, and, uh, and uh, here, and on the stainway, you have uh, three strings as well in the first bass. And finally, you have two strings and one string. But in 90% of the instrument, you have three strings for one key. Uh, that's important because when you tune a piano, you have to manage not only the relation uh, between the interval, but also for each key, you have always three strings, so you, you, have, you have to manage the unison and the precision for each key of unison. Uh, so to prepare for the tuning, Naturally, because uh, the first part, what we call the temperament, it has to be very, very, very precise. It's a kind of architectural construction, a mathematic construction. We will speak a, a bit about in a few minutes. And to do that, because it has to be so precise, uh, what we are doing, we use a felt to isolate some strings, and we, we will get only one string by key to be more precise. So what I'm doing now, I just put the felt and I just keep one string by key. I trying to do it because naturally when you do in front of everybody, it never works like it has, it has to be. So now I have only one string. So, now we are ready for the tuning. I put this felt and the coins here to get only one string, to keep only one string. And now, uh, the first thing is what we are listening. When we tune a piano, 
uh, is it musical here, or what we are listening? So basically, when you have two frequency close uh, one to each other, uh, but not absolutely uh, identi identical, you will get a beat, uh, and you can hear that beat. Uh, it, uh, it's a wave. Uh, so I will try to let you know, listen this. Uh, for example, uh, a good interval to listen, uh, it's the tens. One moment, I, I search one easy to listen. So, this one do, wow, 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 try to listen it. I don't know in the, if you can hear it in the uh, hall. I will try another one to... So, this is the beat. And when we tune the piano, uh, we listen that uh, a lot. And the first things to do when we tune a piano is to do the temperament. So, to do the temperament, we will divide the octave three, three to F3, sorry, to F4. We will divide this octave um, in 12 equal parts, absolutely equal parts. And to do this, uh, we start to take the A on the tuning fork, naturally, at, on that piano at 442. Uh, and after that, we cut the octave in three equal parts. So this measure third has to be at 6.82 bit by second. So we said seven bit by second. And in French, when you teach to students how to listen seven bit by second, we have a, a typical sentence. It is, je voudrais téléphoner. If you say, je voudrais téléphoner, je voudrais téléphoner, je voudrais téléphoner, je voudrais, it's seven bit by second. So, uh, we tune that measure third to seven bit by second. Actually, that's perfect. <laughs> uh, after that, we do the octave. And once the octave is done, it's like in a church, you know, you have an ogive like that, and you have a stone in the middle. And with your eyes, if the stone is not in the, uh, in the middle, it's very easy to see the problem of symmetry. And with the sound, that's exactly the same. We will tune this measure third, and we will put it exactly in the middle of the octave. Uh, so we, we have seven bit by second. Normally we have nine bit by second and 11 bit by second. But it's very difficult to listen seven and 11. So it's like the stone. We, we, we look by, with here, we look, we listen the, the sound and we cut the octave in three equal parts. So normally to do that, you need uh, one year of practice just for this three measure third to, to get seven bit, nine, 11. Once the octave is cut in three equal parts, we will use a fifth uh, and fourth uh, to do the temperament. You know, uh, all musicians here knows that uh, about Pythagore. Uh, the scale was made with a succession of fifth. But uh, if you do a circle, naturally, you cannot close the circle. It's a little bit bigger than the circle. This is the famous Pythagorean comma, the comma Pythagorean. Uh, but if we want to do a uh, equal temperament, we have to close the circle. So the trick is to do the fifth not just, but a little bit smaller than just. And naturally, if the fifth are small, uh, the reverse interval is the fourth, uh, uh, the inversion of the fifth is the fourth, and the fourth is wider. Uh, so we will use, uh, now we have this kind of pillar, and we will construct fifth and fourth, small, small fifth and wide fourth on this, uh, like that. But because we have a pillar, we, we can, uh, we can control with a measure third the progression of the third. Because the fifth and the fourth has to be good, but not only. 
in harmony, uh, maybe uh, in Middle Age, fifth and fourth uh, were very important, but no, uh, everything is important. Oh, oh. <laughs> For the instance, I can talk. So, uh, uh, all the intervals are important so we can control the progression of the third. The major third has to be progressive. So, we, we go from 7 to 11, and each major third has to be a little bit faster than the other. And the order to do uh, the tuning is uh, this one. Three major third, and after that, succession of fifth, and once it's done, we can listen the progression of major third, the progression of six major six. The major sixth has to be one bit by second faster than the major third, so. This has to be one bit by second faster than this. One bit by second than this. This. Yeah. So, once the temperament is done, we remove that felt. And we will do the unison, because you remember there is three uh, strings by key. So, to do the unison, we will take uh, as reference the strings we just tuned in the temperament, and we will do the neighbor strings uh, by listening. Um, and we isolate one string with that, and we listen uh, one string against the other, and we tune uh, the unison. No, oh, I don't have time to show to you, so we'll go a little bit faster. So once the unison are done on the temperament, uh, we will do a, a copy and paste. That's why it has to be so precise, uh, this uh, temperament. And naturally, I forget to say, I say it's seven bit by second, nine bit by second, but it's not a feeling, naturally. It was calculated but by physician, naturally. Uh, because the, uh, uh, the division of the octave is logarithmic, and uh, je ne sais pas le dire en anglais, c'est racine douzième de deux, la division de, de l'octave. So it was calculated by the physician, and the tuner just use the physics, but uh, orally. <laughs> Once this is done, we will use octave. Uh, octave is a neutral interval, so it's very useful, and we will copy uh, and paste all this uh, pitch to the uh, to the bass like that one one string after the other naturally uh, we have some control because you remember the major third were progressive so by the way we will get the, the tense progressive So we have many uh, uh, control like that. Another control is uh, the minor third as to inside the octave as to get the same speed of beat as the major uh, six. For example, this one do wow 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 wow. wow. So it's a little bit faster. It means my octave is a little bit wide. But that's normal because we stretch the tuning of the piano. Because the brain uh, listens the overtone, but if you tune with a computer, uh, a piano, totally flat, all musicians, and particularly the, the violinist, and <laughs> will feel the treble too low. Because uh, the sound is made of overtone, but piano is not a computer. You have a deviation of overtone, and the brain do the mix. Uh, and if you tune totally flat, you will hear the treble too, too low. So what we are doing, we stretch the tuning, we do a kind of uh, curve. I think I have a... So the equal temperament architecture. 
this is a, a flat tuning and this is a stretched tuning. So this is the, a good curve of tuning. You see the bass are a little bit down, the middle is okay, and the treble are higher. So, now I will take a bit of water and we can speak for the last part of this lecture about the voicing. Uh, just a, a last thing about tuning. I saw the control in the bass, uh, but a good trick for pianists, but no, uh, all the tuner will, uh, they, they all want to kill me after if I show that to people. You can control the octave also uh, by, um, naturally, by octave, double octave, uh, triple octave, but also uh, if you have, for example, that octave, and you want to control it, you can just take the measure third below. Wah, 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 wah. Take the speed of the, of the beat and use... And it has to be the same speed. If it's, if it's faster, the octave is too wide. If it's slower, uh, the octave is too narrow. So this is a good control for octave. And it's very really useful to manage uh, this famous curve I showed to you before, because that's the way we can, we know the shape of the curve by here, because we can, it's like a microscope or a zoom on the sound, we can control octave like that. And we can hear the shape. So, now the voicing. I think the voicing is really the most interesting part uh, in my job. Uh, that's the most uh, artistic part in my job. Um, the voicing, uh, I, I said in Vienna we take one day uh, to, to do the regulation and we can take uh, one or two or three more days uh, to do the voicing, only the voicing. Um, so the voicing is the management uh, of the color of the sound. It is not about soft or hard. Naturally, uh, we, we think about uh, the sound of the piano. Is it too hard? Is it too soft? But this is the basic of the voicing. Uh, the voicing is not about hard and soft. It is about the gradation of the sound. Uh, the sound has to be vivid for the pianist. The pianist wants to be able to do something and generally to do some plan uh, of color, for example, in polyphonic uh, music, in a fugue or something like that. When you, if you have full voice, it is good to hear the voice, not only because they have a difference in amplitude, in volume, but also because they have a difference in color of, of the sound. And uh, so to do that, we use some technique uh, on the felt of the hammer, many, many techniques to, to manage the elasticity of the hammer. And I will try to give you an idea of this. So we want a sound, yes, but which sound? <laughs> That's the question. So we don't want a static sound. We want a sound, sound will move and react to the, to the demand of the pianist. Uh, one important notion is the notion of uh, sound efficiency. Uh, that's why uh, you, you play pianissimo, so the piano has to, 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 to sing really soft. But if you start to, to hurt the piano, it needs to be able to cry. So you have a first step like that. And after that, a little bit more, more. And now a lot of overtone in the fortissimo, the color change. Okay. You hear the spectra uh, change in color. Uh, so this is uh, on just on one octave, but the problem is we have to do that everywhere on the piano and equal. <laughs> Uh, it has to be the same everywhere. So this is uh, what we try to do with voicing. Uh, 
Uh, so, les paliers sonores the, the sound gradient, it is what I just show to you now. Uh, and we, we speak about a sound gradient, color, but where, where it comes from, uh, this color? What is it? Uh, because it's good to speak about color, but what is color in the sound of a piano? And uh, the color are in fact overtones, or harmonics, or partial. So I will use overtones today to speak about them. So uh, when you play, you see your brain uh, hear a C and say, "Okay, that's a C." Uh, C1, uh, but in fact, the color of that sound uh, is made by the internal content of the sound. When you play a C, in fact, you 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 your brain do the mix, but inside that sound, you have this. Uh, uh, overtone uh, chain, and this do uh, the the amplitude of each of these overtones inside the C define the characteristic of the sound. That's why if you listen a flute uh, play uh, a C5, uh, you say, okay, that's a flute. And if a trumpet play the same uh, uh, pitch, that's the same pitch. But you will say, okay, that's not a flute, that's a trumpet. And if a oboe play a C5, again, you have something like that. You, you say, okay, that's a oboe because that's the same pitch but the overtone uh, content is very different, uh, the harmonic content. So this is the visualiz visualization of the overtones. You can see the overtones are multiple integer of the fundamental frequency. So uh, first overtone, is, uh, the second one is two times the frequency of the fundamental, three times, four times, and so, so on. And here is a visualization of a piano uh, from a pianissimo to fortissimo, uh, it's stereo, so you have left and right, and uh, if this is pianissimo, this is fortissimo, and you can see uh, if the, the change of uh, overtone uh, presence inside of the sound, and we can listen that as well. Uh, I, I use a, a synthesis technique to do that, because uh, uh, it's not absolutely pure piano sound, because uh, I wanted to, uh, to, to improve the example. So the piano is a bit strange, but you will hear the increase in overtone content. Like on the piano, you, you listen the change of color uh, into the sound. So this is a, a spectral visualization of the C3. And you see the fundamental is very big. Uh, this is the, uh, the amplitude, in fact. This is the frequency, and the size of uh, the line are, is the amplitude. And you can see uh, you, you, we have less and less amplitude in the high uh, overtone. But the fundamental and, and first uh, overtone are very uh, strong on this C3. Uh, Here you can have a, a 3D visualization of the same sound, and you can see the fundamental. And what is interesting in that sound is the second overtone is much more prominent than the first one. So that's the characteristic of that sound. So I made a small uh, a bit of programming to, to let you uh, listen the overtone uh, artificially, so I will use, a, uh, this is a sinus, sinusoid uh, signal, so that's a pure tone, in fact, and we will add overtone one after the other, so you will hear the overtone. But in the nature, the overtone are always different in amplitude, but in this example, uh, all overtone have the same amplitude, so you will listen clearly what is overtone. So this is the fundamental frequency. No, we add the first overtone. Uh, maybe not. <laughs> That's the same pitch, but the color change. One more. One more. Fifth overtone. 
Six, seven, eight. I stop here, but naturally in the piano and in musical instruments, you have a, a lot of overtone. Of but you, 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 you get the idea of the color of the sound. And so now, as a piano technician, uh, I will need to, to change that. But first, just a few more examples. The flute, you see the spectra of the flute. Uh, this is more fluctuant. And that's the typical sound of the flute. The same pitch, but different uh, sound color. And you can see here, uh, fundamental is very present, but moving a lot, and the second overtone as well. Comparing this to the trumpet, a huge difference uh, in amplitude. First and second overtone are very, very strong and very well defined. And you can see in the 3D representation, the fundamental and the second uh, overtone are uh, very strong. And the last example is the oboe. And here it's very interesting because the oboe have a so typical sound. And you see al almost no fundamental, but uh, mainly the second and more uh, intensive is the third overtone in amplitude. So that's the typical um, uh, sound shape of a oboe spectra. And as you can see, the first overtone, the fundamental, is very low. The second one, uh, low, but the third one, uh, very prominent. That's why you have this kind of nasal sound uh, into the oboe. So now the piano. Uh, how we manage that? We will. Uh, one moment. I have to go fast. <laughs> we will uh, change the piano sound. I will not do this part because I'm a little bit late. I change artificially the sound of piano, adding some overtone, but yeah, we, will, we will go. Um, so how we will change that? Uh, the first things, like I said uh, at first, is the um, regulation. Uh, if we change a small regulation, we can change the sound of the piano because we, we change the speed of the hammer. If we change the speed of the hammer, we change the overtone content. I have a, a, a simple example. I will just tie the screw on the same way and you will try to listen the difference. It just changes the pressure on the screw and listen the color of the sound. Before, After, you can compare to the neighbor. I think here in the room, more projection, more power, more color, more fortissimo. I just tight the screw. So the first thing in voicing is the regulation. Uh, tightening the screw is an example, but everything in regulation has an impact on the speed and, by the way, on the sound. Uh, so, Serra Juistri, <laughs> that was the example. Also, naturally, all the friction uh, have an effect, so we use some um, uh, many strategies uh, to uh, eliminate the maximum the friction into the action. Uh, it has to be uh, fast and fluid as possible. Uh, we already speak about this and the distance, naturally. We speak about the hammer distance to the strings. Uh, we said it's 46 millimeter, but if you change from one millimeter, you do 47. Uh, you have to manage the key dip in relation to that, because 
a ratio. But if you do 47, one millimeter more of distance, the piano will get more speed and you will get more projection and more color. Uh, but also maybe less control in pianissimo. So it's up to technician to, to uh, manage this. But this is the effect of the regulation. Something absolutely essential is the uh, contact of the hammer to the strings. This is the ideal. The st three strings are flat and the hammer shape is good, so you have a perfect contact uh, to the strings. To do that, we use uh, uh, some small tools like that. It's a small uh, niveau uh, to check each string one against the other to have a perfect flat strings. And we use uh, that uh, tool. It's a crochet accord. I don't know in English. Uh, strings hook, I think. Uh, and we can, with that, we can move uh, and change the level of each strings to get the strings absolutely flat. So if this is flat, the hammer have a good shape and strings are flat, we have a good contact. Uh, if the one of the string is not uh, in good position, uh, we have not a good contact. If we don't have a good contact, you imagine, uh, this is the shape of the sound. If you have a good contact, everything, it's hurt the strings, everything goes like that. But if one is a uh, strike, just after, you get that. And by the way, tuning the unison is almost impossible uh, to do perfectly. So the three strings are to navigate exactly in the same time. That's why you need a perfect contact uh, of the hammer to the strings. Uh, so and the last example is a very bad example, is a technician who shaped the hammer badly. And the strings are straight, but the hammer is not straight. So a big problem of contact to the strings. The tools we will use, we use some uh, tools, many tools with needle. So this is a, you, you are a bit far, but this is a tool with a free needle. Uh, be careful. <laughs> and we, we needle inside the felt of a hammer. Uh, I will explain a little bit later. We, we have some such a tool also with needle, but a more powerful. And we have some small tool with needle, many tools with needle, with one needle, two needle, three needle, five needle, etc. Uh, so what is important for the sound is the circulation of energy inside the hammer. So the energy has to go when you, I always use my head to explain that. The energy has to go into the hammer. The, it has to be elastic. It go inside the hammer and it has to go up. Imagine a tennis ball on the wall. And, uh, if the hammer is hard, you get this. No elasticity. So uh, you, you cannot use the elasticity of the hammer. So you have a hard sound. If the hammer is too soft, you get that. It absorbs the energy. And the good hammer is a hammer elastic. So we manage the elasticity of the hammer. And uh, so this is the free example. By needing the hammer in different regions. Uh, I will finish quickly. So uh, just to synthesize, uh, this part of the hammer, <laughs> the lower part of the hammer, is the overtone content. If you want to add some treble in the hammer, you will needle in this area. Uh, this is some example here, just near the agraph. Uh, also, you are, we needle in different parts. The top of the hammer is responsible for what we call the body, the density of the sound. And with the needle, we needle here, uh, to relax some part of the hammer, and when we relax some part, the tension inside the hammer move, and we can uh, push the tension inside the hammer to get more body, less overtone, more overtone, uh, less body, and uh, but that needs a lot of uh, year of practice, naturally. So this is the possible zone of uh, voicing, but this is normally for students for voicing. So. Once it is done, we listen to the piano, uh, maybe one day later, we search the most beautiful key, and we start again uh, uh, voicing. 
we find the best key because there is always a key in a piano who are better than all the other. We take this as a model and we start again the voicing. So I will not speak about that. <laughs> uh, level three is almost the same. Equalization. The refinement circle. Uh, tuning, regulation, voicing. Tuning, regulation, voicing. Tuning, regulation, voicing. <laughs> And so on. It's infinite because uh, a piano is moving always. The, the felt, the hygrometry, the wood. Uh, so we have always to, in concert hall, to check uh, constantly the, the piano. Uh, 